and I had my little uh, little uh, uh, CPAP machine with me, and, and then I was able to re replace my CPAP with my uh, my bullet. I got a Nutri bullet, <laughs> Nutri bullet, and and so I carried that all over the world. Lost I, I, 30 pounds right off the bat, and I've kept really the 30 off. That's this is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions Podcast, and I'm your host, Maya Acosta. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life. Let's get started. From heart disease to healthy and active lifestyle, after watching the film Forks Over Knives, Bill Daniels made a significant change, improved his quality of life, and became a co-leader of the group Plant-Based Eating Advocates, also known as Peapod. Bill is part of the Pod Advisory Committee for Plant Peer Communities and also a member of the event subcommittee for PAC. And he's one of the individuals that's helping to organize this online course that we're featuring on August 27th. So we are designing this course to support pod leaders. If you are a pod leader, please send me a message on Instagram or Facebook. I am at Maya underscore HLS underscore podcast. As always, the full bio and the links for each of my guests can be found on the website, healthylifestylesolutions.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Look forward to the, to the discussion. Yay. And it's a pleasure to have you as a member of the PAC Advisory Committee. And you're also part of my subcommittee, The uh, not necessarily mine, but the one I'm part of, which is right. the event subcommittee. And right. um, yes, yeah, so we're working behind the scenes on hopefully providing content to support other pod leaders. Yes. So how yeah. are you feeling so far about being part of this group? Oh, I'm I'm very excited about it. I appreciate the uh, the work that was done last year in laying the foundation, and really look forward to now bringing it to our 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 pod the pod uh, leaders. And uh, I, um, I I I think it's really going to be neat to be able to do the summit. I really love the idea of bringing in all. The other pod leaders to share their experiences and and uh, I think it's going to be a, a great thing. Yes, I do yeah. too. Yeah. So as you know, um, this conversation is part of a series that we're doing to introduce PAC members to the entire Plan Pure Communities Pod Network. Right. So people mm -hmm. are going to get to know a little bit more about you, where you're coming from, you know, what your mm -hmm. background is and um, and then just your experience in running a pod. And um, as you know, we've been trying to work real hard in terms of encouraging pod leaders, giving them ideas in terms of how they can continue to support their communities. So we'll mm -hmm. talk about that, the name of okay. your pod, what kind mm -hmm. of work you do with, uh, with your pod and how you have pivoted, like many of us, <laughs> how we've moved That's virtually. Right. So yeah. let's start off learning a little bit about you, where okay. are you from, and um, how did you learn about plant-based nutrition? Okay. I, uh, I'm actually from Evansville, Indiana. I'm from Indiana, although we have lived from New York City to Los Angeles and and a number of places in between. We just moved uh, a, a a couple of months ago, and this was our 18th move. So, in our 43 years of marriage, we've we've been around quite a bit. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm I'm from Evansville, and as far as uh, plant based lifestyle and eating, uh, it actually goes way back. The first time we really um, heard about it was back in the late 70s actually, when my wife and I were first dating and everything. And we had read a few books from Norman Walker. And he was a he was a vegetarian, but it was primarily a raw food, vegan, vegan um, lifestyle. And uh, but he did allow cottage cheese and Swiss cheese. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we we did that for um, actually not perfectly. We were vegetarians, but we did that for about five years. And then we, uh, we joined a church and the church said, this isn't going to fly. You, you can eat meat. It's perfectly okay. And, uh, so it, it, there was so much social involved. So we, we stopped and, uh, at least being vegetarians and, and then, um, Many years later down the road, we, my little brother said, hey, uh, you need to see a video 
and it was forks over knives. And so from there, uh, we changed things quite dramatically. And so that's been over 10 years ago. Uh, now, I, we're not perfectly, at least I've not been perfectly uh, whole food plant-based in all of my travels and everything, but, but we've been very consistent with that. And as a result, my, uh, I, I learned that I had pretty advanced heart disease, uh, as well as a heart defect and some other uh, issues that went with that defect. So uh, uh, at the time we first saw forks over knives, I could barely walk up a hill. Uh, without chest discomfort, and uh, and now that's totally uh, totally taken care of. But uh, so we're very fortunate, feel very fortunate to have have uh, seen the forks over knives, and and then of course Plant Pure Nation, and and then the the many other uh, videos and 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 all. But we've embraced the lifestyle very much so. Wonderful. So I have a couple of questions about what you just shared. Sure. Um, one of them is in regards to that exposure that you had early on. Were you also doing the juices? Yes, yes. Yeah, Norman Walker. It was primarily raw food. And, uh, and in fact, I lost like 60 pounds. I was a pretty bulky kid. And I lost like 60 pounds. Everybody was freaking out because I was also turning yellow. Uh, from all the carrot juice. And er <laughs> a lot of people thought I had some very serious uh, illness. But uh, but anyway, yes, so that's what it was about. Uh, he had the Norwalk juicer, which we couldn't afford. We had a champion juicer, but <laughs> the Norwalk was very, very expensive for us at that time. But anyway. I do ask about the juicing because there was a time when I also got yeah. into juicing. Mm -hmm. This is before I learned about the whole food plant-based lifestyle, but yeah. I was familiar with the Gerson therapy. Were oh, you yes. as well? Yes, yes. Now, I, I learned about that later on, though. That wasn't, uh, that I, I didn't know about it then. Although there were people like Victor Kolvenskis and uh, 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 a few other names during that period. And I think there were some interconnections with some of those folks. but. So at that time, when uh -huh. you were doing, when you were sort of a raw foodist, mm -hmm. you weren't aware of having had what you currently are dealing with, which is no, um, no, not some form of heart disease. Okay. So you, when you made that change, I don't remember if you said you made it for health reasons. And how did you feel during those five years that you were a raw foodist? And how did you uh -huh. feel when you went back to probably uh -huh. the standard American diet? That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when... There wasn't probably, at least I didn't notice a dramatic change because we were eating a lot of cheese. Uh, no milk, uh, never milk, but cheese was part of that. We weren't eating eggs, uh, but but we were getting a lot of animal products. And uh, uh, so, and one of the things I did find, and this was just uh, a learning experience, is um, when we were more the raw food, I, I just kept losing weight, losing weight. And I was, I couldn't, I, I wasn't eating enough. And I, I think that was part of it. But I do remember those experiences. And then we added a little bit more of the cheese in and, and then uh, I was able to stabilize. But, but uh, honestly, it's been a long time ago, but I, don't I don't remember a dramatic change because it was fairly gradual. Even though at church we were eating more meat and everything, uh, like in potlucks and stuff like that, we didn't change our lifestyle hugely. Uh, but it did as time went on. It's just you get part of a, a culture, part of a uh, a community, and it's it's easy to to go that direction. That's why it's so important to be part of plant pure communities and, you know, to be a part of the community and uh, the support. We become like the people that we surround ourselves by. Right. After you watched Forks Over Knives in the yeah. 10 years that you have not so perfectly, and I like that sort of disclaimer, the way that yeah. you put that, not mm -hmm. so perfectly have adopted and embraced a whole food plant-based lifestyle, mm -hmm. you notice that in terms of your uh, energy, 
and being able to just walk um, without having sort of like shortness of breath, that has improved. I'm assuming that you had an angiogram and other things oh, done yeah. to oh, check. Sure. Have you had any tests done recently to see if there's been sort of a reversal in your condition? Uh, no, but the tests that I have taken don't uh, really show that. They're more of just pictures. I've got a very large aneurysm that comes with the with the uh, with, with uh, uh, the the valve uh, mal malformity, uh, and uh, and so they take a picture of that to make sure it isn't growing. And I've got I've got just a little bit to go, but so far it's it's stayed stayed where it is ever since I've I've well learned about it. But I've stayed on the diet pretty well. That's great. Yeah. This is very encouraging because oh. at least you know physically how you're feeling. Usually these are, we have the symptoms when something is developing and we become very aware. Right, right. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, uh, and I, I, I traveled non, well, not nonstop, but 50% of the time. And I had my little, uh, little uh, uh, CPAP machine with me and it, I threw it through the through the uh, the scanner and and then I was able to re replace my CPAP with my uh, my bullet. I got a Nutri bullet, <laughs> Nutri bullet, and, <laughs> and so I carried that all over the world. And uh, and so uh, so anyway, I just I've had terrible apnea and lost I, I've thirty pounds right off the bat, and I've kept really the 30 off that's fluctuated this winter. I've gained some weight and a little too much bread and, uh, but, uh, it's, it's whole grain, but it's still very concentrated. Well, you know, I appreciate what you just said though. And, and I, and I repeated it, but we do this lifestyle not so perfectly. I myself over the course of the pandemic have, I've continued to be an ethical vegan because that's something I will never uh, give up. But I discovered the food delivery service for the first time uh, the later part of last year. And yeah. suddenly I noticed my cholesterol level went up. And so once I started to revisit some of the mm -hmm. content related to, you know, um, reading labels and uh, also understanding where you find saturated fat in plant foods, mm. It made sense to me. Oh, I'm, I'm eating curries with coconut milk. Oh, yes. I'm eating a lot of cashews, but also, you know, donuts, vegan donuts. <laughs> there <laughs> <And> you go. <laughs> that yeah. happens. But instead yeah. of being very hard on myself, I decided to clean up my diet. And mm -hmm. sure enough, my cholesterol whoop, went, went down, down, like quickly, yeah. quickly went down. And I'm so proud of myself. And I'm going to kind of stay like this. But um, let's mention a little bit about why you do travel. This is related to 31 years that you've huh. spent in health and safety and right. traveling can be very tricky. Oh, How yeah. do you travel with all your ingredients, all your spices? So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about the previous work that you've done. Well, I, I worked in the field um, uh, at least the last 30 some odd years, as you mentioned, in environmental health and safety. And, uh, and then a little over 10 of those years, I, I traveled um, uh, rolling out um, uh, different health and safety and environmental campaigns. And so uh, in doing that, I, I traveled to a lot of different countries and from the top to the bottom of the Americas. And, and, uh, and so, uh, but during that period, I, for half of that time, well, ne no, nearly a, almost all that time, I was doing plant-based. Now, when I, when I would I would carry a lot of stuff with me. I always had oatmeal. I always had granolas. I always had rice cakes. I always, I would have nuts and different things that I traveled with. Um, I've, I've, I learned that even though I would get by with it sometimes, I used to carry potatoes with me. Uh, but one time in Mexico, it, uh, they held me up till like two in the morning because I had potatoes in my suitcase. <laughs> At least they, they, uh, I was the only one uh, of the team that, uh, oh my God. didn't get through. And then I, I had a, had a note that said, you know, they took my potatoes. So, so anyway, um, but I used to, uh, I had a system. I used to travel with, uh, dehydrated soups, even though they're, they're high in salt, but they were, I could put that on a potato and, uh, and, uh, so there, I had a system 
I would do my overnight oats and and then a lot of times, especially the the last part of my career, I would travel, which I'm retired now. I've been retired for two years. Uh, I would uh, I I would try to go to a hotel that had real oatmeal <laughs> and, and real <laughs> cooked oats, uh, and so so. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of how I did it. I I even had cards and Spanish to help me at some of the restaurants. There was a service, a, a company that would do that for you. And, uh, and I, I don't think I have that anymore. And so I had that in my wallet and going to India, I did the same thing. Uh, now, one of the challenges though, that many of us find, it, we can do pretty well eating vegan on the road. Uh, but Oil is just almost impossible. When you, well, it's almost impossible here, and we live in a very open, kind of liberal community, a college town, and we've got lots of different restaurants. And uh, but to get a low-fat type of meal, and uh, that's not always easy to. That's that's difficult. So you you learn the tricks of of uh, you know asparagus and really emphasize. No oil, nothing, you know, and we, most of us that have done this for a while, we, we learned those tricks and you, you can do pretty well. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you can. But still, I admire you because you are trying to still stay healthy during your travels, mm-hmm. but you're also traveling for business. So it's right. very different than someone who's traveling for, you know, on vacation mm-hmm. and has the time during the day to meal prep, cook their mm-hmm. foods. So right. very tricky. Right. Yeah. Um, but we, we try to do the same thing. We try mm-hmm. to go to places like, uh, you know, use Airbnbs or places mm-hmm. that have kitchen nets. And then I've been known to travel with my small instant pot. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so in the past, uh, I did, I would travel with a luggage full of dry ingredients. And now things yeah. are becoming more easy. You know, uh, there are supermarkets in many places now where you can right. easily go and do right. your groceries. Like Walmart. Walmart is a great place to visit internationally <laughs> um, because they have a good, you know, good selection. Right, right, right. Yeah, I I used to love it in the big cities. Now I didn't always travel into big cities, but there would be a Whole Foods market or or one of the other types of markets I could very often find. And even abroad, many of the markets there were there was a good selection. I just needed help by somebody locally to take me, you know, to a market. Right. Um, And in Mexico, at least one place that I was at, when I asked for tofu, they actually call it, um, in Spanish, es como queso de soya. So it's more like cheese made out of soy. Oh, uh uh-huh. Because it's very comparable to fresh cheese, queso fresco, that is more typical in Mexico that you Mm. sprinkle over almost everything. Not yellow cheese, but the... um, not cheddar cheese or I don't know because I, I don't do a lot of cheese. <laughs> well, I, I I didn't do much cheese yeah. um, most of my life, but I, I did like the fresh cheese. And yeah. so tofu, when you crumble it, is very similar to some mm. of the fresher cheeses mm-hmm. in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So now let's um, move forward to uh, after you, you watch Forks Over Knives, you did mention that at some point you saw Plant Pure Nation. Is mm-hmm. that around the time that you became involved in a pod? Actually, it was probably a few years before. I I didn't get involved in the, that was, I would say that was maybe four years, three or four years before, maybe. Uh, yeah, but I was traveling so much. And, and I honestly, I didn't do a lot of extracurricular stuff um, uh, during, especially those last 10 years of uh, when I was traveling. But as soon as I, uh, as soon as I retired, I remembered Plant Pure Nation and, and then I went looking uh, and I saw that in Bloomington that uh, they had a pod. Uh, Bloomington, Indiana, that they had a pod. So I forget if I called or anyway, I, I got a hold of someone and I found out, yes, there is one, but it's inactive. So I immediately got it going. And then we had our first meeting. It was only like four people, uh, but but we had some people. And, uh, and then over the next few months, uh, 
um, Glenn Merzer joined me as the co-leader. And then we, we started having great potlucks, 20 plus people. Great, we thought, for, for Aria, and because uh, it is a small community. And, uh, and then the pandemic hit. And so things, uh, it, so we really only got to do it for about five months and then boom, here came the, the pandemic. So, uh, Oh, we but, didn't realize it was so new in terms of it being active again. Yeah. Yes. And then, uh, then from there, we, we paused for a, a few months, not for sure, you know, of what to do. And then we, uh, uh, we decided, well, let's, let's, let's do zoom meetings and, uh, one of the people um, had an account through their church, one of the, the members. And so we started doing Zooms and we had people like Glenn, the author, uh, Glenn Merzer, speak. Uh, uh, we had a local plant-based nutrition doctor speak. Uh, one of our members talked about, about uh, um, veganism. And so we, we were able to really do quite a, quite a, uh, a few uh uh, a few presentations, and we've continued to do that. In fact, Glenn's going to talk about do a new presentation of his in a uh, well this coming weekend. Um, and uh, and so we've continued to do that. Sometimes we just have a get together meeting, but our our attendance hasn't been as much for our Zoom calls as it was for the potlucks. Uh, so we're we're really hoping now. That, that we're going into the summer, we're going to start picnics up again. And initially, you bring your own food, and then hopefully we'll be able to do potlucks again. Oh, that sounds like a wonderful thing, especially yeah. as the weather yes. improves yeah. picnics. I've never done a picnic, yeah. and that's been a dream of mine. Yeah. So it's interesting. Also, you said before watching Plant Pure Nation, you were sort of already interested in gathering mm -hmm. uh, with other like-minded people. Mm -hmm. it, that's what happens with us right. when we adopt this way of, of living, is that we want to spend time with people that also have these values. Yeah. I know that we've been limited, but what's been the most pleasant thing about being a pod leader? I think it's just learning from others, I, I would say, uh, to be able to have community, uh, whereas my wife and I, we've, we did things really on our own for years, uh, and uh, no friends, even though they would put up with us, and some of our friends would do some really nice meals that were whole food, plant-based, uh, but it it's mainly just us no family members <laughs> yeah even my little brother who who told me about uh, uh forks over knives he it was just interesting to him and 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 so uh so yeah it so it brings community we've got very good friends uh that are regulars and and so uh, i think that's really the key for us uh, there is some recipe sharing but i have found it's really more, more the, uh, the the camaraderie and the community uh, for most of us. Definitely, and I'm I'm thinking about that as you're saying that because I too find, um, you know, I, I've said that I stopped eating red meat and pork. <laughs> I mean, many, many, many years right. ago, and I didn't make a big deal out of it. I would travel mm -hmm. to see my mom, and she would just say from time to time, "What am I going to cook for you?" Yeah. yeah. But I would stop at a Whole Foods even back then oh, wow. and pick up nut milk mm -hmm. and pick up alternatives, uh, rice cakes too. I remember, mm -hmm. whoo, <laughs> back in the day I used to do that. I haven't done a rice cake in quite a while. Yeah. So I didn't really make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. I just thought this is the way I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that suddenly all, a lot of us want to connect because yeah. it's so much more it's bigger than our health. It's right. about animal welfare. Right. It's about contributing to the wellness of our planet. Right. Um, there's just so, it's just so much more than that. And there, there's so much literature, there's so much evidence and science behind okay. this way of living. And um, as we talk about the environment, I was hoping that you can share with our listeners yeah. these three goals that you had uh, as you approach retirement, which okay. you are now in. Yeah. So that way we can get to know you a little bit okay. more. Um, but what were those three goals of that, those three things that you had yeah. on your list? Well, since I traveled so much uh, the last part of my career, I, I wanted to do the plant-based thing. 
help in some way. Uh, I wasn't for sure what that would be uh, as I was looking at retirement. Uh, secondly, I, I wanted to be able to sing again. I, I'm a vocalist, and uh, and so I've got an undergrad degree in musical theater. And so I just wanted to sing again, and I am. I'm singing in the church choir. I've got <laughs> I've got uh, rehearsal tonight, and then uh, and then the third thing I uh, my early career from 14 to 31 I spent uh, in horticulture. At least that was the consistent theme. I did theater and I did uh, did a few other jobs, but but it was really the consistent theme. And so I wanted to get back to growing plants and specifically. Uh, I wanted to get into native plants. And uh, a lot of people don't realize so many of, especially our ornamental plants, are um, they're, they're brought from, from Europe, from Asia, and they, they look pretty. They don't have any bug holes in them. Uh, and even some of them are deer resistant. But... Uh, but unfortunately, those plants did not evolve with our native wildlife, in, 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 in particular, our insects, and especially our caterpillars. So, uh, so it's very important that we move as much as we can to native plants in that if we want birds, we need insects. We need those caterpillars. Uh, and there's been a lot of folks talking about, about like the monarch butterfly and growing milkweeds. Many people that may not understand other things, they do understand that, uh, or they, they've heard of that. Well, pretty well, all of those insect uh, plant, nearly all the insects have to, they can only eat a, a certain certain plants or certain types of plants. Uh, and uh, so, and if you don't have those plants, then you don't have the insects and then you don't have the rest of the, of the, uh, the, the ecology. So, so anyway, that was my third thing. And, uh, and I, I do that quite a bit uh, and running, uh, uh, coordinating a, uh, a native seed project for the Indiana Native Plant Society and just so anyway, I'm doing the things I, I really wanted to do. And actually, I'm getting about as busy as I was before. <laughs> so anyway, but that's okay. It sounds just with the, the uh, Seed Society that you're part of, yeah. that that in itself could be a full-time oh, job. Yeah. And I'm very fascinated in that topic. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, are there societies like that in every state there are. where they address native plants? That there really are. I, uh, in fact, there's a listing that you can look at and you can go on to 50 plus. There are a few other organizations, but in every state, there is some type of organization uh, that that is involved with native plants. That's such an important topic. As a matter of fact, I recently had an individual who um, has a wonderful YouTube channel and she teaches people how to care for houseplants. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. And yeah, I invited her on the show because I, I love plants and I want to learn more. Yeah. And I don't necessarily have a green thumb, although some people think that's a myth, whether you have yeah, a green thumb or not. <laughs> she came on the show. And another reason why I really wanted to speak with her is because she talks about the environmental impacts mm -hmm. of just caring for houseplants, yeah. just having houseplants in general and um, the carbon footprint. And you sort of just touched on that. Mm -hmm. We we are not always familiar with how the distance that plants and flowers travel mm -hmm. just so that we can have them. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, I kind of always was bothered by buying flowers from a no, a local nursery mm -hmm. and having them die within <laughs> seven to ten days or however long. Right, I just right. it just kills me mm -hmm. to take a, a beautiful flower that is um, flourishing in the ground, mm -hmm. take it out just to watch it die. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, <laughs> but in general, she talked to us about the footprint and she was giving us ideas in terms of maybe trading 
um, uh, plants or uh, cuttings. I think they're cuttings. She talked to us about propagating. She talked to us, yeah, all sorts of things yeah. that we do not necessarily know about because, uh, you know, we're not gardeners. Mm -hmm. And we were specifically talking about house plants, but I'm sure that if we learned also about native plants in general right. and how we can support our insects, mm -hmm. we would be contributing to helping our planet as well. Absolutely. And even when you think from uh, uh, a veganism standpoint, how important that is for, uh, for uh, our land use, because uh, even though there are a lot of us vegans, it feels like, and there's a lot that's, that we're seeing in the news and, and uh, on, on the web and everything, um, meat eating is still going up. And when, when we're eating a lot of meat, we're either cutting down more trees uh, or we're, uh, we're using more, uh, more public lands to graze our cattle. And so uh, one of the, uh, there was a study not too terribly long ago that said in the United States, vegans use about 10% a, a less land. And so if we, if the whole world went ve vegan, we could free up the land for this, something like the size of Africa. And, and there are studies of, of doing that. So, so from, a, uh, it, from a, an actual land use, environmental, biodiversity standpoint, the more we can eat plants, uh, plant-rich diets, the more land that we, we can free up. And so, uh, so it, uh, another thing uh, from an environmental standpoint is the fact that uh, a tree, it's, trees are so important, especially the right trees, like an oak, it'll support over 500 different caterpillars. Whereas a ginkgo tree, many people know a ginkgo, really, they, 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 there's research of one or two caterpillars on it. Not for sure if it's really you know, if it's just part of the study and they happen to be in the wrong place, re really important that we also have plant-rich habitats and we get away from grass. And And um, I know you and I have talked about permaculture and forest gardening. Uh, the more that we can do that on our own properties and having this richness of plant life, you're you're drawing down carbon in the plants themselves. You're pulling it down into the soil, into the root structure. So grass just doesn't do it. It's got roots about, you know, just a, a few inches uh, long. You really, the, the more native plants, the more trees and shrubs and different uh, diverse layers, uh, the better better from a that of our mental standpoint too yeah. it's amazing how yeah. much we do not know about our own backyard oh right in terms of our own surroundings mm -hmm. i know that josh wayne yeah is very much into foraging right. and that's another thing that i'd like to explore and learn more about um yeah. and i recently was saying that i i just bought a book uh a recipe book mm. with um plant-based vegan or plant-based recipes uh -huh. that are Mexican. And they talk about native plants. Of course, they use the word indigenous, right. but they yeah. talk about indigenous plants that are edible mm -hmm. and good for our health, mm -hmm. medicinal in a sense yeah. that are viewed as weed. Mm -hmm. And so companies like Monsanto go and destroy these plants because for whatever reason, they don't see the value of it. Right. And so I was thinking to myself, wow, even if they're not in my backyard, I wonder if there are areas within Dallas or in the outskirts of Dallas where certain plants, mm -hmm. um, you know, edible plants are growing that I could benefit from. But uh, also, yeah. you just never know with all the chemicals that are being sprayed everywhere. <laughs> right. It's right. hard to know yeah. what you can actually eat. Yeah, uh, there's a company here in the Midwest. It's called uh, Indigenous Landscapes, and they focus on those indigenous native plants that were used by uh, the Native Americans uh, and um, and can still be eaten now uh, today like uh, uh, sunchokes or are uh, the Jerusalem artichoke or whatever uh, and it's a beautiful flower and and uh, so can we learn just a little bit more about permaculture because that's also a field I'm not very familiar with yeah uh, 
permaculture is really looking, it, it's combining of a couple of words, permanent, permanent and agriculture. And, and it, is, um, it, it is thinking about the, the holistic, uh, the whole of, of the landscape and of the, the foodscape. Uh, from um, having your, your your trees that pr- produce fruits, uh, shrubs maybe that pr- produce berries, and and you think again a rich a rich in this case a, f- a rich habitat, but but also just a, a rich uh, a landscape, uh, plant rich landscape, and so uh, so and then then you you you've got your herbaceous uh, material. Uh, plants and and so you're putting these all in a in a, a system, whereas they're all supporting each other. Uh, the whole landscape is now. It's very common to use animals and in fact uh, animals in this this system. But um, uh, Heather, for instance, she teaches um, vegan vegan permaculture and uh, and vegan agriculture. And so it's not needed where the animals get get you know the the nutrients and and everything they get them from plants. You can compost plants. It doesn't have to go through an animal first. And so uh, so, but it, it's a very holistic system, uh, keeping the water on site uh, in cisterns or or uh, uh, just uh, catchments. Uh, the, metal or plastic catchments and that kind of a system. Is it becoming more uh, common? I, I think it is. I think it is. I I, I know uh, organizations like Drawdown uh, talk about the principles quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and so I, I know there's a lot of discussion around regenerative agriculture and so forth, uh, a term that means so many different things. There isn't... Uh, isn't really a, a a a good clear definition of that, uh, but uh, uh, regenerating the soils are important. But again, uh, the, you're led to believe you have to have animals to do that, and you absolutely don't. And in fact, if you really want a, a diverse ecosystem, uh, these uh, invasive uh, uh, species, these cows, which are really a uh, they're a, a non-native invasive species, and they do not react the same in our environments as as a buffalo would or any of the other uh, native ruminants. So, so anyway, you don't need cows to be able to have a, a beautiful, plant-rich, uh, productive uh, garden. And so now these topics, mm-hmm. um, permaculture, just horticulture, um, native plants. Mm-hmm. Do you uh, offer lectures for your own pod, and or is this something that you're planning on doing? Well, actually, no. I I really we haven't done that. Uh, it's uh, not something that I've purposely not said I'm not doing. It's just I I do do lectures on propagating native plants from seeds, and uh, I'm a master gardener, so I I uh, hit up a a, a number of the uh, master gardener groups in in, in Indiana, and uh, and then also we've got groups that are very engaged in uh, in doing uh, invasive species control, a uh, uh, plant species, and so I've I've uh, uh, partnered with them to put on presentations on how to grow native plants from seed and 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 uh, that kind of thing. But I've really <laughs> I've not really done it with our with our group, um, but it, it's uh, it's something I could. I I've I've wondered. Okay, you've got I've got these native plants, and they're important. And if we're eating vegan, if we're eating a plant based way, then we're freeing up more land for more native plants and more diversity. But I've not really connected those two, two things together. And I'm not necessarily suggesting more work for you because you did say <laughs> <I would be laughs> you fine. have a lot on your plate. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, this is great. So uh, coming back to the pod advisory committee, uh -huh. and uh, it looks like we're going to have a lot going on. That's yeah. going to keep us pretty busy yes. this year, um, brainstorming mm -hmm. how we can support pod leaders. Um, so do you have an, uh, like a message right now for pod leaders that may have sort of given up hope because they have not been able to meet in person? Well, I, I think from just thinking about the the pod advisory committee we we are really working hard on a on a summit uh, as we already talked about I believe right at the very beginning and uh, and in fact what we're wanting to do is to to reach out to our pod leaders and see if they have any topics that would be helpful for for team members uh, the other for other leaders uh, Maybe it's about cooking a specific thing, or maybe it's about their experiences online, or maybe they've got, uh, they're an expert at some topic that would be of benefit to the pods. But we, we're going to be pulling these folks in, and, uh, and then hopefully that it, there will be some usable tools that they'll then be able to take out, take back to their pods. And, and I think that just as far as encouragement, we're already seeing some movement. Uh, hopefully, uh, it continues with uh, the coronavirus, and hopefully, as we'll be able to do a more person-to-person -person activities, and that will only increase, I think, the, the energy of 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 our local pods, the the whole movement. I think. Uh, I was listening today uh, to a podcast and somebody, it was on biodiversity, and they were talking about, well, we, we, we've we lost two years, we're kind of behind, but now we're really starting to be able to kick it in and we're finally seeing movement. And I think it, it's happened to us too, and uh, as long as we can keep the, the viruses at bay and we can move forward, uh, then uh, I, I think I'm really excited about what the future brings. I'm very excited also about just being part of the Potty Advisory Committee and then, of course, the event subcommittee that we're part of. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to help revive pod leaders to come back and, and really look at their skills and how they can continue to contribute on a larger scale uh, through a summit, for example. Yeah. Well, I, I think another event that we're working on is how to take your pod online. And even though we're talking about in-person things, I, I think our culture is going to keep doing things online. It'll be nice to be able to have those skills, you know, to understand from people like you, uh, what kind of mics and, you know, some of the other, other uh, advanced stuff. And I'm really looking forward to that for us as well here locally. Yes. When I think of, for example, some of the pioneers and how much traveling they used to do, mm. a lot of traveling right. in planes and right. cars. And so now they can still continue to broaden their, their reach mm. from their own home, for example. Right. Okay. So now if people are interested in learning more about your pod, mm -hmm. and I know that Glenn Mercer is on there. We had him on the show as well. Yeah. And I love how he focuses on the environment. If people are interested in, in hearing more from you, both of you, and presentations that are going on, how can they learn? Well, we've got our, our pod is uh, Peapod. It, it's uh, Plant-Based Eating Advocates. Uh, uh, it's the P is an acronym. And uh, we, we do have a, a small Facebook uh, presence. And we communicate what's happening on there. Uh, most our participation has primarily been local, uh, and uh, and so uh, that's probably the the best place. And then through the the pack and uh, plant pure communities, I I'm more and more engaged there too. And also for our listeners, wow. in case you have never watched any of these documentaries, you know, Bill did mention Forks Over mm -hmm. Knives. And it's amazing how many people have watched that documentary. I feel like yeah. that's the starting point for a lot of us. It is. We watched that documentary. Yeah. The one that got us to be involved as pod leaders, mm -hmm. at least for myself. Well, I'll take it back. I also started my pod before watching Plant Pure oh, Nation. Uh -huh. 
again, uh, because my husband and I didn't know anyone right. that was vegan yeah. in our community. Uh, and so um, we wanted to be able to offer and share the message to people that had never heard uh, it. Uh, we had watched some other documentaries like Forks Over Knives. But once we were already gathering and, and then I watched Plant Pure Nation, mm -hmm. I said, uh, and suddenly I had this profound sense of purpose to get involved because I know that change is going to happen from our level, from the grassroots level, touching one person at a time and helping a person, one person at a time to transition. Yes. Uh, do you have a final message for, for our listeners who are either interested in joining a pod or maybe creating a pod of their own? I, I think um, it, I invite you to do so. If there isn't a pod, the first thing is uh, you can go online on uh, a Plant Pure Communities website, and you can you can search your your uh, your zip code. You can find if there is a pod in your region. Uh, for us, um, just to give an example, we uh, there there was a pod, although they went kind of inactive during the, they have gone inactive during the pandemic in Indianapolis. It was about an hour and 15 minute drive, but my wife, Noni and I, we would go up there and, and visit them before, while we were thinking about doing the pod down here. So, uh, so definitely go online. And uh, if there isn't a pod in your area, you can start one and it doesn't have to be, it, it can just be a group of friends in your little town of, of a thousand people. It, it it doesn't have to be some big, big major uh, group. And in fact, ours isn't huge. Uh, it's very small. So I encourage you to, uh, uh, if you're not already connected to, your, to a pod, get connected and start a pod. It, it doesn't take a lot of effort to, to do that. It's very, very much worth it. Thank you for that message. Yeah. And Bill, thank you for taking the time well, to share your story with us. Yeah. I love that you have this background as a master gardener because there's so much that we can learn from you. So, <laughs> well, well, thank you. Really appreciate all that you do for the plant-based movement and and for Plant Pure Communities and and also for our, our events committee. So, you've laid uh, quite a, a terrific groundwork for us to to be able to do a, a jump from. Thank, thank you. you, Bill. Well, have a nice day. The lives of Bill and his wife, Noni, changed dramatically for the better after viewing the documentary Forks Over Knives, and shortly thereafter, Bill read Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study. Before being inspired to transition to a whole food plant-based diet, this new lifestyle has allowed Bill to return to the things that he loves, such as singing in the choir, being a member of the Indiana Native Plant Society. He enjoys giving lectures on propagating native plants with seeds, and he's also a master gardener. In a previous episode, Glenn Mercer joined us to discuss his book, Food is Climate. It just so happens that Glenn is also a member of Bill's group. Make sure that you listen to that episode. That's 157 at healthylifestylesolutions.org forward slash 157. Living a plant-based lifestyle gives you the opportunity to restore your health so that you can focus on your passions and life purpose. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Bill Daniels. If you haven't done so, make sure that you watch Forks Over Knives and leave me a message about today's episode. Speakpipe.com forward slash HLS is where you can leave a voicemail. As always, thank you for being a listener. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave an honest review as well at ratethispodcast.com forward slash HLS. This helps us to spread our message. And as always, thank you for being a listener. 